Hello, I'm Arthur Kent. Welcome to History Undercover. It's well documented that the CIA tested the effects of LSD on hundreds of unsuspecting subjects in the 1950s, and that the government withheld treatment from black syphilis victims during the infamous Tuskegee experiment. Not so well known is that many other Americans were used as human guinea pigs. Our program reveals how government agencies exposed millions to toxic chemicals and radioactivity without permission and, according to critics, without regard for the potential dangers. Join us as History Undercover presents Declassified Human Experimentation. Declassified documents reveal that from the end of World War II through the Cold War, hidden under a veil of secrecy, the U.S. government performed military tests on large populations. In the late 40s and early 50s, patients were injected with a radioactive substance while in their hospital bed. See, my, my father never told me. I never knew that this happened to him. Soldiers were exposed to radiation to test their performance in a nuclear war. In the 1950s, the Army released bacteria and chemicals at sea, in the air, and underground. I found out that four of my pals that lived directly across the street from me had all died of cancer. These are four separate families. In 1995, a presidential advisory committee confirmed that for more than three decades, hundreds of thousands of Americans have been unwitting participants in human experimentation. It is a very, very important piece of America's history, and it will shape America's future. East Rochester, New York, in the mid-1930s and early 40s, is a typical blue-collar town. John Musso, son of a large Canadian family, is among the hard-working men at the railroad yards, building and repairing cars. He meets Rose. They get married, settle down, and raise a family. Over the years, John's health deteriorates, and he is diagnosed with Addison's disease, a chronic disorder of the adrenal glands that weakens him and leaves spots on his face. When World War II erupts in Europe, very little changes in John's life. He does not know that the strong memorial hospital where he is treated as an outpatient has become part of the war effort. The hospital is being used for research by the Manhattan Project, the top secret unit developing the atom bomb. The Manhattan team operates from inside this high-level security building across the street from the hospital. Only authorized personnel are allowed in. Research was determined entirely within the Manhattan Project itself, and it might be determined by Manhattan Project scientists here in Rochester, or it might be the result of directives that came down from Los Alamos or for Oak, from Oak Ridge, which is where the, the, the medical chief was headquartered. The university would have no ability to look at what kind of research was being done here. John Musso, like all other patients at the hospital, is oblivious to the government's top secret activity and he continues with his routine visits to see his doctor for treatment. In 1945, the war ends. As Allied troops liberate the death camps, the world learns about the horrific experiments conducted by Nazi doctors on prisoners in the camps. Experiments that almost always resulted in cruel and painful death that they were war crimes, that these Nazi doctors could have been tried for murder was eminently clear. But the Americans ha had the ambition, not simply of condemning a war crime, but of condemning a war crime committed in the name of medicine. When the war crime tribunal is set up in Nuremberg to bring Nazi criminals to justice, special attention is given to these doctors and the experiments they conducted on humans. The result is the formulation of the Nuremberg Code, a universal rule of conduct regarding any human experimentation in years to come. The first principle, critical principle, 
of the Nuremberg Code is you don't get to do research on anyone without their permission. The voluntary consent of the subject. Now, obviously, the uh, victims of the uh, Nazi experiments had not given their consent. And Nuremberg quite wonderfully lays out consent as the bedrock principle for human experimentation. The trials of Nazi war criminals make very little impression in Rochester or the United States as a whole. And so on February 1st, 1946, a doctor that John has never seen before, Dr. Samuel Bassett, approaches his bed and gives him an injection. John assumes that this has to do with the Addison's disease. Dr. Bassett does not provide an explanation. But the injection given to John Musso does not contain medication. It's a radioactive substance, plutonium. John Musso is one of 18 patients who are used as human guinea pigs, all injected with small amounts of highly toxic plutonium. The, the impetus for the plutonium research was the result, more or less, of, of an accident that had happened at Los Alamos. A scientist, a, a tube of plutonium had, had burst in the face of, of a, a research scientist. He had actually ingested some of the material. It was unknown what kind of effects that, that was going to have on them, this individual. But there were other concerns about plutonium, about its toxicity in general. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer and, and Lewis Hempelman, both of whom were at Los Alamos, were determined that some human experimentation needed to be done to determine animal studies simply were not sufficient. The doctors wanted to find out the plutonium's whereabouts in the human body and observe its mobility. There is no indication on the patient record charts that these injections were ever given these patients. The research was top secret. It was not to be indicated to anyone, not even to the patients, as we, as we now know. With poisonous plutonium flowing in his blood, John Musso goes on with his life. His poor health bothers him continuously. It was a constant battle for him to maintain his equilibrium and uh, to fight off very common everyday ailments like colds or infections. He had a very, very severe problem in doing that. And uh, we, we attributed that to Addison's disease. On June 21st, 1973, at the age of 72, John Musso is called back to Strong Memorial, and for the first time, 26 years later, he is told about the plutonium injection. He is asked to do some follow-up tests and gives his consent. He does not say a word to anyone about the plutonium test. On May 6th, 1984, at the age of 82, John Musso dies, taking his secret with him to his grave. But the story doesn't die with him. A few years later, and many miles away, Eileen Wilson, a reporter for the Albuquerque Tribune, is researching some newly declassified documents. I was thumbing through the reports my eye fell on a footnote and it said something about human beings who had been injected with plutonium and I was dumbfounded by this you have to keep in mind the context in which I was looking at these records I was all alone in this dusty basement these reports were 40 and 50 years old and they were all about dogs who they had been who had been injected or ingested with plutonium and had developed tumors and all kinds of diseases and then were sacrificed. So when I saw this uh, reference to humans being injected with plutonium, I immediately thought, my God, uh, how could they have done this? And, and what happened to these people? So I went back to the paper and that following Monday I came in and I told the city editor I said, hey, I found a great story. And I said, 18 people were injected with plutonium during the Manhattan Project. And he said, well, that's a great story, but that's not what we hired you to look into. But Eileen does not give up. For the next five years, slowly and stubbornly, she continues with her investigation. 
requesting more declassified documents under the Freedom of Information Act. I got a few fact sheets, very few documents on the experiment, and they said that was all they had. But by then, I knew from other sources that they must have had a tremendous amount of information and that they were simply blowing me off. Five years have passed when Eileen finally uncovers the names of five of the 18 patients. One of them is a John Musso in Rochester, New York. She looks up all the Musos in the Rochester phone book and starts to make calls. To know a John Musso in the area, he would have been about in his 70s or so, maybe close to 80 when he died. He suffered from a disease called Addison's disease. Do you think that he would be amenable to talking with me? Uh -huh. And you have his telephone number? I was, I was shocked. I, I, I didn't want to accept it. Uh, I, I guess I was kind of rude. I mean, I just, I didn't, I didn't know nothing about it. And I said, you know, what, what this could happen in the United States of America? They're going to treat my father like this? They're going to put this stuff in him? And I, I, I got kind of rally. I, 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 I said, I want nothing to do with it. You know, I just, it just hit me so, so hard and so bad that I just, I couldn't think right. I just, I cried. And I just, I couldn't handle it. I just couldn't handle it. See, my, my father never told me. I never knew that this happened to him. After the initial shock, the anger set in, and um, the disillusionment, uh, uh, the uh, distrust of the government. If something was stolen from my father. We don't know what, what opportunities that could have come about after this Addison disease, if he didn't have this plutonium. I mean, there's maybe, like, I felt like I got cheated. I got cheated that we didn't go fishing as much as we did. I got cheated we didn't go hunting as much as we did. That he wasn't there when I played the sports to watch me play. My dad wasn't there. I felt like I got cheated a little bit. I mean, I, maybe you're saying it sounds selfish, but I don't think it's being selfish because you want to be with your dad. And like other people in the block always used to take me with them, but it wasn't my dad. It wasn't my dad. Not long after the end of World War II, the American public is drawn into the fervor of the Cold War. Let's face it. The threat of hydrogen bomb warfare is the greatest danger our nation has ever known. Enemy jet bombers carrying nuclear weapons can sweep over a variety of routes and drop bombs on any important target in the United States. The threat of this destruction has affected our way of life in every city, town, and village from coast to coast. The nuclear race towards a superior atomic bomb pushes research into new frontiers, and with it reaches a new dimension in human experimentation. Between 1951 and 1963, the United States conducts 925 tests of atomic and hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere and at underground sites in the Nevada desert. It has been established from government declassified records that as many as 200,000 military personnel participated in these tests. Among them, 3,000 serve at the test site as subjects of research. The military wants to find out how troops perform in a nuclear battlefield. Almost all of them are soldiers who have followed orders given by their superior officers. Very few are actually asked to volunteer. How about radiation? You think there's much danger from radiation? Well, radiation is the least of the worries that the men are thinking about. I think most people thought that radiation was the greatest danger, didn't they? Where did they learn different? We were prior to our instructions here. We received a very thorough briefing before we even came in this close to contact with it. You feel that those instructions have given you confidence in your ability? Very much to... so. One of the soldiers in these foxholes is Marine pilot Chuck Brody. We met in 1948. I was spending my vacation in San Francisco 
and with a couple of other ladies from, from our office. And uh, we went to the officers club for dinner. We met these three officers. And we sat around a, a table and the music was playing. Chuck finally asked me to dance. That was it. I just clicked. He proposed to me that night without ever even touching me or kissing me or anything. He said, I've waited all my life for someone like you. Soon after, Chuck and Pat get married, and Pat becomes a proud wife of a Marine. In 1957, the United States plans to detonate what will be the largest atomic bomb ever to be tested in the atmosphere, codenamed Hood. And Chuck was there, close to ground zero. He was in the front row trenches. There were ground officers there, and there were pilots. They would rotate. The Marine Corps wanted all of their people to know about the safety of radiation exposure, so they could go back and teach the troops how safe it was. He didn't tell me anything. He was sworn to secrecy along with all of the other men. They were told that if they talked about their experiences, that they would be guilty of treason. But the night before Hood is detonated, Chuck calls Pat on the phone. He said, get the kids up at 4.30 in the morning and face the east, and you'll see something you'll never forget. I saw Hood. I saw this bright light in the sky, which slowly diminished. That's the only time he ever talked about that experience. In 1963, nuclear tests in the atmosphere come to an end due to a test ban treaty. Soldiers go home to their bases and families. In time, many retire and start civilian life. Records about the possible lingering effect of their exposure to deadly radiation are kept secret. So is classified information about the nuclear fallout carried by winds, dust, clouds, and rain that in the 1950s covers all 50 states. One morning, we woke up, and, and while he was uh, applying his uh, underarm deodorant, he noticed there was a large lump under his arm. And so, we immediately went to the doctors. The doctors do tests, which show that Chuck suffers from a terminal form of cancer called lymphosarcoma. The doctor informs Pat by telephone. I was totally unprepared, of course, and I, I didn't know what to do. I was there alone in the house. I tried to figure out how I was going to tell the kids. We have four children. How was I going to tell Chuck? So I managed to, to do all that. And so we then went to an oncologist, and he started chemotherapy. And he did pretty well for the first six months. And then it was downhill. He died of uh, lymphoma. I was devastated. My children were, my, his family, his brothers and sisters. It was such a waste, such a horrible waste. Chuck, who was exposed to the radiation in 1957, dies 20 years later. Pat scatters his ashes near their home along this Southern California beach. Before he died, he um, contacted an attorney it was at that time, for the first time, Chuck told me uh, something about his exposure. With her lawyer, Pat follows up on Chuck's revelation about his exposure to radiation. Trying to gain access to classified information would become an agonizing and an uphill battle with the federal government. It takes Pat years of research and legal proceedings just to obtain her husband's military and medical records. 
She is not alone. Thousands of other families of atomic veterans spend years requesting declassification of government records, trying to prove that they qualify for compensation. The government is waiting for us all to die. Most of the men have already died, or they're on their way. There's a lot of widows that have died. We're all old. The women don't know the history of this whole thing. There are no records. And when they ask for compensation, for disability and indemnity compensation from the VA, they say, prove it. They've got, the, they've got the documents. We don't have the documents. They've got the proof. We don't have the proof. The military establishment's fear of a nuclear war couples later on with fear of biological and chemical war. What if the Soviets spread deadly bacteria over highly populated areas or spray into the air invisible chemicals that can kill thousands on contact? A decision is made in high places. Tests are needed. San Francisco Bay, California, 1950. During seven days in September, the Army simulates a bacteriological attack on the city. Declassified Army documents reveal that in six such attacks, Large amounts of bacteria called Serratia marcescens are sprayed towards San Francisco from a small Navy boat in the bay. Carried by the wind, the airborne bacteria spread over a large area. The Army wants to know how far the bacteria can go. These declassified maps of the actual test show the extent of the area that is covered. The Army decided to do what was called a vulnerability test program. And the effort was over a period of 20 years, actually, between 1949 and 1969, when hundreds of tests were conducted over populated areas to see whether, by spraying germs and certain chemicals, whether they would endanger a large population. And the Army did spray a lot of bacteria around, although they weren't the highly dangerous kind that would be used as an actual weapon. The bacteria that they used did have some health risks. The invisible attack would probably have gone undetected, but something goes terribly wrong. A few days after, 11 people are admitted to the Stanford Medical Center in San Francisco. They are all suffering from a severe bacterial infection. One of the patients, Ed Nevin, dies. I was nine years old in 1950 when, uh, when he died. My mother was a nurse. She was actually helping to attend to him. And it was a terrible sickness. He was going from, uh, from high fevers to chills. He had uh, hallucinations. And so it was a very, very serious infection and fever that was causing all that in him. The Serratia marcescens infection is so unusual to the doctors and scientists at the hospital that three of them team up and write a scientific article about it. At the time, the doctors are unaware of the test the Army had conducted using the same type bacteria just days before. The scientific article is published in October 1951 in the Journal of the American Medical Association, reaching a very limited readership. However, the Army does see the article, and a panel of four military scientists reviews the case. Some months after, they concluded, and this is a very strange conclusion, that the Army's bacteria and the bacteria that caused the infections in the hospital were not of the same strain or the same nature, and that any, any relationship was apparently coincidental. That was a real stretch. It takes 25 more years before the story finds its way out into the open. I carried the morning paper on December 22nd, 1976 to the uh, art station. I was reading uh, the front page and 
read with some interest because of my work as a trial lawyer. The front page told a story of testing that was done in 1950 in San Francisco. I was surprised, but actually somewhat cynical as a trial lawyer. Nothing surprises me anymore was sort of my then 35-year-old attitude. I uh, turned the page and was shocked to find my grandfather's picture. And they related the story that, in fact, he was the only one who died from the testing, that he died from serratia marcescens, the very bacterium that was sprayed in the air. Nevin consults with his family and decides to take the federal government to court. The trial begins on March 16, 1981, more than 30 years after the actual event took place. The heart of the case to me was that you can't test uh, American people like guinea pigs. I mean, if we have anything in our country, we, we proudly look at uh, with disdain upon the practices of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain countries of those days in the midst of the Cold War. So the heart of the case to me was this, this terrible discovery that uh, we were no better than what we were describing. Three months later, on May 20th, the Honorable Judge Conti rules against Nevin on all counts. He concludes that the Army's decision to test falls within the discretionary function exception, which gives the United States government immunity from lawsuits on such matters. The United States Supreme Court later upholds this ruling. What would have been required to win this case would have been to overcome hundreds and hundreds of years of tradition of governmental immunity that we got from, uh, from England, and that was a king. And it was still a remnant of our law, even in America, with our form of government. And his honor, at least, felt it became clear that uh, we couldn't overcome that, uh, that special protection the government has. You just can't sue the government for these important matters, uh, says the immunity doctrine. And so what it would have taken to, to win the case would have been to overcome that immunity doctrine, and at least in these judges, it wasn't so. San Francisco is not the only city targeted for a simulated biological attack. Declassified documents show that two years later, a similar test on a much larger scale takes place in Minneapolis. This is the house I grew up in. This is 29th and Clinton. The school is behind me, about a block and a half. I played on the playground. All of my friends were in the neighborhood. It was a very middle-class working neighborhood. Most of the, our mothers stayed at home. We were the typical 50s housewives. Our fathers were working. We were in and out of each other's houses all the time, running in and out the way children will do. It was a very nice, safe, secure neighborhood. In the summer of 1952, the Army turns this safe and secure environment into a testing ground, simulating an attack with bacteriological weapons. During a three-month period, from 8 in the morning until midnight, Hundreds of military personnel spray clouds of zinc cadmium sulfide over Minneapolis. Zinc cadmium sulfide is a material that's totally synthetic. It was created specifically for the purpose of doing these types of experiments because it was completely different from anything else that was in the air. The airborne powder is sprayed from trucks in the streets and from canisters on rooftops in both commercial and residential areas. The Army then monitors how far it travels and where it lands. No one is exempt from exposure to the zinc cadmium sulfide particles, and the Clinton Elementary School, no longer in existence but similar to this school, is one of the targets the Army subjects to massive spraying day after day. It was a day that many were waiting for, a chance to tell the scientists about health... In 1977, KTCA, a public television station in Minneapolis, breaks the story about the Army test, focusing attention on alleged high rate of health problems at the Clinton School. My first reaction was disbelief. I thought, no, never, this is, this is not true. <laughs> I was in denial for uh, many, many months, and during that denial time, I was, I was really determined, I'm going to find out everything about this. 
she is not alone. Public hearings soon follow. Many come to hear testimonies, to listen to the experts. Total disclosure and nothing but... Diane's own memories start coming back. I vividly remember being lined up, going into the music room. There was an older gentleman sitting in a chair with a light wand in his hand, and he was passing this over our bodies on the outside of our clothing. I started contacting my old school pals. I started keeping a list of illnesses. The bottom came for me when I found out that four of my pals that lived directly across the street from me on Clinton Avenue had all died of cancer. These are four separate families in no way related health-wise. They died within a year of each other back in the early 80s when these um, people would have been in their 40s. And I thought, well, this doesn't quite seem like a coincidence to me. During her research of declassified documents, Diane finds that Army doctors came back to the Clinton School the following year, 1953. They found a high rate of asthma, respiratory problems, and some cases of pneumonia. A report of the Minnesota Health Department also found that in the same year, the rate of infant mortality in Minneapolis is unusually high. The causes listed are pneumonia and other respiratory problems. The toxicity of zinc cadmium sulfide is virtually unknown today, just as it was in the 1950s. If it remained in its native zinc cadmium sulfide state, it probably presents a low toxicity to people and to the environment. But we don't know to what extent the zinc cadmium sulfide might be acted upon by bacteria or other agents in the environment to break it down. And if it broke down, uh, there is a possibility that the breakdown products are much more toxic than the zinc cadmium sulfide itself. As of today, there is no conclusive evidence that the zinc cadmium sulfide is responsible for the ailments reported by the Clinton School's graduates. And the Army still maintains that the chemical used for the simulated test is perfectly safe. They have not been forthcoming. They have not been helpful. The fluoroscoping they totally denied. And I kept insisting. I said, look, I have report after report from all various um, uh, groups of students that's, that remember the same thing. Then the Army uh, said, oh yes, there was some fluoroscoping. So from the very beginning, it's been up to us to discover what happened, confront the Army, and we're still waiting for the medical reports that we requested six years ago. The Department of Defense, their conviction that this is a perfectly safe material is an oversimplification because we do not have any information about the possible long-term health effects of this particular material. The National Academy also, of the, the viewpoints of the public Minnesota, who were exposed to this material uh, and the anxieties that, that have been expressed by the public have not been addressed at all effectively by uh, our government agencies. It completely changed my memory of my childhood, which I thought was rather idyllic and very middle, middle America, to know that um, these tests were done at my school um, absolutely uh, was a shock to me. After the tests in San Francisco and Minneapolis, the Army mounts another test to see how the bacteria behave underground. The target, the New York City subway system. Over a three-day period in the summer of 1966, Plainclothes Army agents simulate a bacterial attack on unsuspecting commuters on the Broadway subway line. In their briefcases, the agents carry ordinary-looking light bulbs filled with bacteria called Bacillus subtilis variant Niger, a non-toxic microorganism. The agents enter the subway station and wait for the confusion of the train arrival. 
As the train pulls to the platform, the agents discreetly open their briefcases, taking out the light bulbs, then drop the bulbs on the ground, releasing bacteria into the air. Unlike San Francisco or Minneapolis, there are no immediate reports of any ill effects from the spraying. We can safely assume that while some people might have gotten ill, it wasn't, the numbers were not huge. Furthermore, the number of serious illnesses was probably minimal or maybe zero. We don't know because no one was monitored. Just how many Americans have been sprayed from the sea, land, and underground over this 20-year period? Have there been other similar tests in later years? It is hard to tell. Many details are still kept under secrecy in classified government documents. We don't know the precise number, but millions of people at one time or another during the 1950s and 60s were inhaling the, the biological or chemical agents that the army had been spraying. In the late 1970s and through the 1980s, Congress conducts hearings and demands further declassification of documents in an effort to learn more about the risks involved. The story about John Musso and the other 17 patients injected with plutonium in the late 1940s finally finds its way into the open. In November 1993, after five years of research, the Albuquerque Tribune runs Eileen Wellsom's story on the front page of the paper. When the first installment came up, I sat there really expecting to be deluged with phone calls. I thought, this is so outrageous that people are going to call me. I didn't get one phone call. The story really didn't hit the press until Hazel O'Leary mentioned it at a press conference in Washington, D.C. I would like to tell you that what I've been told about these experiments, what I think I know and have processed with respect to these 18 citizens of our country, leave me both appalled, shocked, and deeply saddened. That if the government had in fact been responsible for, had been the proximate cause for harm or danger, uh, to the lives of any of our citizens, then the government ought to be in a position to own that and also to compensate for it. Now, the first time I uttered those words, there was a firestorm. I had no idea that anyone would think that that was a bizarre or strange thing for a cabinet officer to say. O'Leary's statement is so unusual that the national media picks the story up and the Department of Energy is overwhelmed with thousands of phone calls each day. She starts an in-house investigation at the Department of Energy. The task is not an easy one. It requires a review of millions of documents in government archives and warehouses all over the United States. Many of them are still classified. O'Leary brings the issue before President Clinton and in 1994, he forms a presidential advisory committee to look into human experimentation with radiation. The committee does not investigate the bacteriological and chemical tests. After a year of intensive work, the committee submits their report to the president. If this committee's work is to mean anything, it has to be that 50 years from now, there does not have to be another presidential committee charged with investigating alleg allegations of abuses of human subjects. The report reviews the history of human experimentation and investigates ethical standards, but it fails to satisfy the expectations of the victims. Essentially what the committee did was say, these experiments are wrong, but no one is to blame. So they did not find one doctor or one institution guilty. And as far as this large community of people who had been uh, abused and unethically used in these experiments, uh, the committee recommended that only the families of the plutonium patients be compensated. 
they come, came out with a report that does have some good information, but families of people who feel that they were used in these experiments are essentially still at ground zero when it comes to getting these documents. I think if I were on the other side, I'd, I'd be feeling the same thing, uh, especially since the, the experiment, the effort had been, had begun with such lofty expressions of ideals from me, from the President of the United States, and from uh, Ruth Faden, who chaired that committee. We over-promised because we were, we were so naive, we didn't know the government couldn't and didn't know how to deliver. We were all very naive. This morning, I signed an executive order instructing every arm and agency of our government that conducts, supports, or regulates research involving human beings to review immediately their procedures. Some new procedures are already in place. So there really aren't any serious risks to the study. A lot of people may have a tickling or a gagging. Doctors who conduct such experiments have to explain in detail the nature of the study and obtain a written consent from the patient. Sign that for me, please, and we'll get started. Things are, are very different today, and, and actually our institution doesn't accept any type of um, secret or classified research, and we also retain the right to publish on any of our on any of our research. Um, DVTs or uh, deep vein thrombus. Ethical review boards are set up at medical research centers to openly discuss and approve experiments on humans. If by doing some great experiment or great project that the government proposes means compromising an individual's well-being it would never get approved. So today, on behalf of another generation of American leaders and another generation of American citizens, the United States of America offers a sincere apology to those of our citizens who were subjected to these experiments, to their families, and to their communities. Given what I've learned about medical research and human nature and the federal government, that, it, that, that in 50 years' time, reporters will be writing about unethical experiments that were conducted in the 90s. And the reason I think that is because human beings are human beings. And there, there will always be a few people that step over the line. Anyone who perpetrates an act, uh, assuming that it is secret and will remain secret, has to know that sooner or later, truth will out. Sooner or later, we will find out. And so, as you move to act, understand that if not today or tomorrow or even next year, eventually the historical record will catch up to you. Uh, and we will know what you did. Human experimentation hasn't been limited to the United States. The British government recently admitted that millions were secretly sprayed with a toxic chemical in the 1950s and 60s. Military officials conducting germ warfare experiments thought they were spraying a harmless substance but later discovered the chemicals may have contributed to medical problems. Critics accused the government of gambling with public health.